Larsh is the name for a number of communities of and for the developmentally disadvantaged. It was founded over 50 years ago, in 1964, by a Canadian, Jean Vanier. The universally celebrated L'Arche movement has now grown to close to 150 communities worldwide. But it began in northwestern France, in the village of Trolley Bray, in the forest of Compiègne, near the river Oise. I first met Jean Vanier when I arrived with camera and crew at L'Arche, English translation, The Ark, in the fall of 1967, less than three years after its founding. We knew that L'Arche was a radically new approach to helping the severely handicapped, a rescue mission, a permanent relief from the incarceration of many of them in asylums that resembled prisons. The dungeon-like conditions which prevailed at the time of L'Arche's founding were designed to keep the afflicted out of sight and out of the lives of the rest of the population. These radical reforms were led by Jean Vanier, the son of the then Governor General of Canada and World War I hero, Georges Vanier. What we found was remarkable, given how new L'Arche was. The stress was on community, on creating an environment to which the handicapped could belong and which belonged to them. The striking part of every large community is the entertainment provided by its members. And almost invariably, that involves music. We asked some musicians presently at Trolley Bray to provide music for this new film. They assembled in the chapel. It began without knowing what it was. And I didn't even know what I wanted. There was an element of justice, of struggle for justice, of truth. You can't treat people like this. plight of all these boys in general, uh, you find that either they just stay at home and do nothing and are unhappy, or else they're moved into psychiatric hospitals or into asylums, and in general they haven't got a place to where their personality can flower out and where they can be happy. And uh, I felt that, I just felt that, that I was called to do something uh, in this particular situation. Jean Vanier, ex-naval officer, on a summer sabbatical from his teaching post in philosophy at the University of Toronto, was introduced to their plight by Father Thomas, a Dominican priest. At the end of that first summer, 
Jean Vanier decided to remain at Trolleybray, and L'Arche was born. He's still there more than 50 years later. There were promptings inside, and so I left the Navy. And uh, not quite knowing where to go, wanting to follow Jesus, um, I was able to find a place in a community near Paris, which was run by a Dominican priest, Father Thomas. And I, I came knowing lots of things about Navy and gunnery and warships. And, that. and then I had that bonding with Petama. Uh, when he spoke or when he gave talks, it was as if life was flowing through my body. It, it wasn't my head, but there was something coming through the body. And so I, it was obvious that in some mysterious way he was my spiritual father. I, I discovered a world of, you know, that I'd never heard about before. And visiting the small institution where Petama was chaplain, um, I was just very touched by the men. When I went to visit them, uh, they didn't want money, they didn't want it, they wanted friendship. It was a cry, will you be my friend, will you, you know? I visited an institution which was, I can say, a horrible institution. Um, there were 80 men in this institution, which was built for 40. Um, there was no work. They were closed up behind walls and so on, with no possibility of leaving. And inside there was a lot of violence and screaming and all this sort of stuff. And uh, so I met there two people, Raphael and Philippe, Raphael Simé, Philippe Seux. So everything sort of fell into place. People with disabilities here, where is their fulfillment? Their fulfillment is in laughter, in joy, in celebration. I mean, laughing together. I mean, there's something, there's a sort of blossoming forth of their, of their being. And of course, what has happened for me and for others, I can say that when I started L'Arche, uh, I had been a teacher of philosophy, and I had been at the commune, I had been left the Navy and all that. that so I would say that in some ways I became a child. We began in a dilapidated house. Nobody today would allow anyone. I mean, we didn't even have a toilet in the house. We just had a tap. There was no heating. Well, August, you don't need it. We were able to arrange things in the garden. A little. I mean, everything came together. A yearning that I'd always had to live in community, a yearning to live with people who were broken, uh, a yearning to be close to Petama. So um, it, things came together, and you know it is right. <laughs> Fundamental principle, principles, 
the first that each person is precious. Each person. Uh, whatever their culture, whatever their religion, whatever their disabilities, or whatever it is, that each person is precious. The second principle is you can only discover your precious if somebody sees you as precious. If you're treated as being no good, you become convinced that you're no good. And then you can move into either depression or a form of hatred of self. So the principle of relationship, because the human beings, we begin in relationship. are beautiful. You are the most beautiful child in the world. I mean, there's that sense that only you are the most beautiful. And so a child begins life after the comfortable time in the womb of the mother, uh, begins life with that knowledge that you are love. You are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, in whom I'm so happy. Now, if a child does not receive that, and let's face it, there are children, and they're in the streets, they've been abandoned, they've been hurt, they've been abused, they've been all, all, all the horrible things. When the weakest person is abused, well, then something shifts within him or within her. And then he has to prove as a baby, that I'm going to do this on my own. Because he doesn't know that he is loved. So if you don't know you're loved, then you have to prove that I am someone, and it'll then be cultivating the systems of power, of hurting, of oppressing others, and, and so on. So everything begins with relationships. So there's something very particular, not just living together, but a meeting. And meeting is a sort of something happens, as if we have been bonded together in a moment of communion, mutual presence. And what I think we've become much clearer is the difference between communication and presence. We're in a world of a lot of communication, internet, Facebook, uh, and God knows what, because I don't know about them. But people can be communicating all the time uh, through words. But they're frightened of presence, to be with. And to be with is a mutual recognition of you giving me something and I'm giving you something and so there's a, behind a meeting, there is a humility. Uh, to meet is not to do things for people. It's not to tell people what to do. It's somewhere. What is the eternal within me meets the eternal in you. What is infinite in me is infinite in you. That, that's a meeting between. So meeting implies a transformation. So people can come to do good. Uh, people can come to struggle for justice. But then you discover something that you discover as you meet the person, something has happened. Something has been reborn or be born within me that I discover that to be a human being is not just a struggle to do good, not just a struggle for peace, it's to live peace, and that's something very different.
<laughs> so the fundamental principles is that you are precious, but to discover your preciousness, you need somebody not only just says it, but lives it. And I would say lives it through touch. It's about holding hands. And people don't get lost if there are enough people to hold their hands. The population of every large community is made up of two elements, the developmentally handicapped and the assistants who have come to help them. Some of the assistants leave after a year or two, while others remain for a lifetime. Almost all share the conviction that they have received more than they have given. You see, the big thing about L'Arche is that we are grounded into reality. We don't have ideas. I mean, well, we need a few ideas. But the most important is reality. And reality is you, that person with disabilities. What does that person who cannot speak, who cannot walk, and so what does that person need? to be fulfilled, to grow, and, and so on. So discovering of what love is about, but grounded on reality. So the whole mystery of Lash is how to harmonize reality, experience, and the word, the word of God, a, a vision of humaneness to bring together uh, the idea which should be a vision and not just an idea, bringing together reality and the idea. Why people come, I would say, has evolved uh, from the discovery of something new and interesting to the discovery that it's a place where I can be welcomed. I may have been hurt or failed an exam or whatever it is, but the revelation is the same. Uh, the revelation of somebody who has been hurt doesn't quite know who they are. And they can discover that through their eyes and through their hands and through their flesh, they can give life to people. And this is a sort of Amazing. They discover that compassion for the person who is broken, who is screaming, and, and all the rest. But this is changing them. They're discovering who they are. I felt that I wanted to see what it would be like to really live intensively around other people. Um, and I suppose particularly with people with a learning dis difficulty or... Um, of different kinds. I, I, when I first came, I felt a little bit out of place. When I first came for a lunch 
at the Foyer de l'Arche. And then a, a, a guy called Olivier, um, who has Down syndrome, came up to me at the end of the meal and took me by the hand and showed me around and helped me to, um, helped me to, to take part in the activities of the place. And instantly I kind of felt I had my place, I felt welcome there. And I think that, that moment really uh, was, was key for me and it was something that I, I guess, um, an experience that I've come back to um, repeatedly over, uh, over the period that I've been here. You know, this idea of feeling that you have a place where you're, you're not everything, but you're something. People can come broken because they want another world. They want a world which is more human and where each person can find their place. But they're lost in a world where the only um, objective is normality and success and economy and power and control. So many young people are lost. And so they can glide towards Lash through Google or other ways and then discover something incredibly new. That these people who are at the bottom of the scale of humanity, that they're revealing something fundamental. So we always come back to the same thing, that assistants come not knowing why, hoping for something, but then discover something completely different. <laughs> You know, I was I was part of something bigger than myself, and that was that's really what I think I've got back from being in the community. Then, of course, there's the individual friendships that you make. They discover that it's difficult, they don't know how to relate. They don't know how to listen. Uh, they know how to tell people what to do. They're trained in telling people. But they're not got that idea of, of listening and bringing people to birth. So they go through a period here, and many of those future priests, I mean, they, it was a sort of almost a shock for them because they've been trained in the head, but to discover that to be a human being and therefore to be a Christian is to know how to listen to people and to reveal to people, not to seek to convert them, but to reveal to them that they are precious. It's the place of covenant, where they're in a mysterious way bonded together with people with disabilities who have lived rejection, who have been hurt, who have hurt their families, who have been put in institutions. It's the place of covenant, a place of bonding, a place of presence. And as they come to the place of presence, they discover who they are, and to be at home is to be well in their body, to be at home in themselves, be well in a community. So they will stay if they discover home. But that doesn't mean to say it's always easy, because there are also pressures coming from family. Their brothers and sisters are earning more money. Uh, their family don't want them to be in Lash, because after all the studies you did, uh, to be in a place like that, living with people like that.
When I began with Raphael and Philippe, and, you know, I mean, this was a small little, little community. And we were happy there, and it was a place of laughter. I would say, when you communicate with people who have certain intellectual disabilities, I mean, where you meet is on the realm of the heart and of laughter and fooling around. We began Lars as a small uh, outflow from the Catholic Church, if I may use that expression. Uh, Pat Thomas was a priest of the Catholic Church. And uh, over the years, there's been a little shift. Um, first of all, the discovery of ecumenism, the discovery of the mystery of that we are bonded together more by our love of Jesus uh, and that religion can become a prison and not uh, a fountain. So, because there's the dangers of closing up. Mine is the only real religion and, and the others are no good. I mean, there's this tendency of, of protection, of defense mechanism. One day, perhaps, there would, be, uh, there would be the need in India for this sort of work. And there might be, um, perhaps, if I, when I go back, I, would have, I could do something in this line there. And as far as I can see, I, I would like to stay in this particular line because, uh, as I said before, it seems to me something that's worthwhile. When I went to India in 1969, and there discovered a whole world of, first of all, Mahatma Gandhi, who was an incredible man, of a vision of what it means to love the enemy. I mean, Jesus tells us how to love the enemy, but on a political, social, to love those uh, who are against you, which is to discover in them their treasure, that they are beautiful people, but maybe they've been misguided and so on, and they've become oppressors. So there's something extraordinary that I discovered through Mahatma Gandhi and other leaders in, the, in Hinduism. And then this came even clearer later with, with Muslims. And, and so there was a slight shift, and it's a sort of mysterious shift, that if you haven't lived it, can you really believe it? And here we're touching something. And what is that shift? Is that living with people with severe disabilities, you change. Yes, that we've already said. There's a, a change, and I discover something about tenderness. So that, that's important. And I would say Lash is a school of tenderness. And the icon of tenderness will always be the mother and the child. I mean, there's an icon of tenderness with the cheek of the child on the cheek of the mother. As large communities developed in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa, 
Larche became a model of ecumenism developed not as a matter of policy, but in response to a need. You at the bottom of the ladder, I discover you're more beautiful than you can imagine. There's a beauty in each person. So I would say the shifts have been continually in this sort of discovery, moving from a community which was really religious to, uh, to the discovery that the purpose of religion is to love. To love is to accept all, to excuse all, to believe all, and to hope all. That demands a complete change. Their fundamental gift is to celebrate and to laugh and to fool around. And it helps us discover what it means to be human. So it's a gradual transformation. I mean, Jesus says that you can only enter the kingdom if you become like little children. So there's something about the revelation of what it really means to be human. We're together from people from different cultures, religions, handicaps, lack of handicaps, or whatever it is, but we are together. We're celebrating our humanity. But somewhere has been lost that. Uh, you don't need whiskey to celebrate. In fact, it, it doesn't help. What to celebrate is togetherness, being together. So I, I would say the fundamental thing is much deeper than what we can learn through our heads. It's the gradual revelation of what it means to be human. It's becoming one. It's oneness. It's oneness with people, oneness in oneself, oneness between the spirit and the, the, the mind and the heart and our body. It's about coming together into oneness, where people are being stressed and strained for uh, success. Whereas the reality is, you know, get down from your pedestal, have fun, but have fun. You see, somewhere at the heart of the message of Jesus is when you give a meal, don't invite the members of your family. Oh. Don't invite your rich neighbors. They might give you some money. Don't invite just your friends because don't just stay in a clan, a group. But Jesus, when you give a really good meal, invite the poor, the lame, the disabled, and the blind. That's to say, those who are on the margin of society and who've been pushed away. Bring them in, and it's their celebration. Celebration is breaking down the barriers that separate people. Community is not the place of security. Community is necessarily the place where there can be divisiveness. Because community is about welcoming difference. So if you have a community 
where everybody must be like the founder, it's going to very quickly become sectarian because everybody must think like the founder and they are unclear about the mission. So unity comes as we learn to live difference. That means somewhere there has to be a change about what community is about. The big thing is how to harmonize freedom and belonging. And it's not always easy that, because belonging very quickly, you can stifle freedom. You must be like this instead of being yourself. And too much freedom, then it's anguish, conflict, you know. So how to harmonize freedom and, and belonging. That means clarity in mission. And for us, our strength is that our mission is clear. It is that people with disabilities are precious and important and are called to grow and to grow in freedom. So to accept that the other is different, but then finding uh, what is the mission of the family, mission of the children, but vision, the vision that we might have in family of, of working for a world where there's more peace and more love and, and so on. So clarity in the mission. And as I say for Lash, clarity in working together. So, I mean, there must be something where together we really believe that every person in the community is important. The people who does the sweeping, the cook, and that, that somewhere we must be people who are yearning for unity. And that unity is all of them learning how to work together, how to listen to, to each other. So um, I would say that our strength in Lach is the clarity of the mission. Life has been for me a gradual consciousness of, uh, of growth to love, which means, you know, there were many times when I, I wasn't present enough to people. There's been a gradual learning, also moments of discovery of, of myself, the violence that is in me and reality, because to be human is to have anguish. To be human is to have violence. Uh, the whole thing is to learning that it is there and admitting it, and the gradual, in, in the degree one can, uh, to let it be transformed. Uh, that our attitudes are not ones of rejection, but uh, attitudes of listening. So, I mean, there's been the whole process of of learning and listening to people. Amen. 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 
Magnifica, Magnifica. Because obviously with, with life growing, it, it became something where we were in movement, uh, traveling to India and then the community starting in, in uh, Haiti and Latin America. I mean, there was a sort of movement and I'd even say a certain excitement. The big question was, you know, how to keep our unity. Where is our unity? 120 communities with Japan, Philippines, uh, the United States, England, and all the rest. You know? And he started a movement or a, a question about identity. Who are we? Somewhere there's been the loss of the preciousness of life. So I think that life is something much bigger. It's so small, and yet it's so extraordinary, because it's about the plan for humanity. Thank you. 